All right, well, today is Thursday, April 14, 2022, and this is the week in charts. I'm just going to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you turning up, showing up, whatever you want to call it, on a holiday weekend like this. Thank you so much. I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we talking about? Well, on one day, this should be the 14th, obviously. Anyway, current market conditions, I'll have a lot to say about that when I get to the charts. Your questions on trading, obviously, and if you have any favorite stock or pip, crypto picks, once we get to the live charts, let me know. We'll do crypto first and just put a dollar sign in front of it. Oh, by the way, if you want to join these shows live, would love to have you. DaveLander.com slash webinar. So what are we going to focus on? Well, the secret to long-term trading success. And I woke up thinking about this this morning because we've been blessed as of late. And one client was like, Dave, you're on fire. I'm like, well, that's just momentum, okay? It's not me. And I guess it's me in the sense that you chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it, and then bam, you knock it out the park. But I don't want to brag too much because things change quickly, as you know. So the secret to long-term trading success spoiler alert, is establishing free position, sort of letting the market pay for your trading, so to speak. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more detail. But basically, a little spoiler alert, that's free rolling that I often talk about. And then I want to show you a couple of discretionary ways to improve upon that further. And I was thinking as I was putting my slides together, it's like, you know, I keep showing the same stuff over and over. It's like, well, wait a minute, Dave. Those were the same exact trades that you took. That's exactly how you made money by following your own plan, by following your own setups, by following your own patterns, by following your own money management. So I'm going to keep showing that stuff, especially when it works, obviously. <laughs> and I want to follow up a little bit on how I played last week's windfall. Remember last week we went through the SST trade with the options and everything. I'm just going to show you how one account fared overall. And I did take the trade across multiple accounts. That'll make sense in one minute. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading or as off to sum it up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Laurent says, hey Dave, on holiday trading, so I can finally attend, looking forward to hearing from you. What time is it over there? That's uh, Australia checking in with us. That's pretty awesome. All right, let's follow up on the SST trade. If you can't sleep at night. Go back and watch last week's presentation when you get a chance, if you're watching a recording of this, and check out what we did with the SST. So let me just follow up on that and close the loop. Now, Stanley, Dr Stanley Druckenmiller, I threw this in last minute. He once said the way to build long-term returns is through preservation of capital and home runs. And that's exactly what we do with the swing trade profits. And then holding on to a couple of long, couple of longer term home runs. Now, every now and then we're blessed with this huge gain over a short period of time. And you really have to be on your A game when that happens. And I'm gonna show you that now or follow up on what we did last week. I actually would rather make a lot of money over time in a position and stay in it for two or three or four years or longer, but I'm not complaining. If one of these comes along every now and then, it makes life pretty nice. So just to recap, last week on this big, huge spike higher, 100% move, I did some options trading. Some of it failed miserably. And then I also peeled off some shares, which worked out pretty good. And then I realized at the end of the day, based on my trading service, I should still be long this stock. So I started out with 1,000 shares, and I'll show you the whole trades or listed trades in one minute now this is in one brokerage account i did different sizes in other accounts too but this account this account is a good round number a good round thousand shares so you kind of see what happened now i ended up buying on this gap higher i ended up buying some 20 strike calls for three dollars and 20 cents and i held on to my shares and then flipped them out i think i ended up flipping them out I actually flipped about a little bit lower. Now that I'm looking at it, 22.69. And then by the end of the day, I was able to flip out two of those calls at 750. So I think that was after we talked about it last week. And if not, uh, the, the remaining shares were 
The next day I flipped out one at 930. And then I put in an S and G order for 14 points. And this is a, a call again, I paid $3.20 for. And that bugger got hit. And that was pretty exciting. That's that's the ultimate to quote Linda Rasky, feed the ducks while they're quacking. All the Sephoria's out there had that limit order already in place. I guarantee you, if I'd have saw 34 by watching a screen, by the time you get an options order in with all the complexities of putting a limit order in and everything else, the risk of fat fingering, et cetera, I guarantee you I wouldn't have been able to get those shares off at 14, those options off, or one option in this case off at 14. Anyway, one at 930, one at 14, and one at 750. So the shares were a profit of 1700 and, and some of these are overlapped from last week. And I'll show you everything again in just one second. And then the new options trading turned, there's your gains from those and some of the old, older options. I'm not sure if I covered some of these options over here last week. I know we couldn't cover the eighth because the show I think was on the seventh. But anyway, so that's how I ended up playing that. If you take a look at all the trades and how it all shook out, it worked out fairly nicely, so it's about 10K in here. I did, if you look up here, he's like, hey, Dave, I see a loss up there. It's like, well, yeah, uh, these options expired worthless, but this was kind of like an s and trade. Now, I know you can't get a little bit pregnant, but if you've got a nice five-figure gain in a stock, it's okay to fritter away a little bit in a tip to hang on to that stock and squeeze out a little bit more money okay so that's how it all shook out i know i kind of just rushed through it this week but basically what i did was i was able to flip out those options that i bought the day before at a double plus now let's take a look at some of the recent setups that have done okay in the portfolio and this believe me is a secret to success. So we had this RES, and you can see the parameters there. Buy at 1050, stop at 850. Risk, that's two points risk. So an IPT would be 1250 at the IPT, initial profit target. We're taking half of our shares off. And this is based on a hypothetical 100K account, but I will punch in my account sizes up here and take the required amount of shares at least for the trade. Now, sometimes I might have a, a bigger account and I don't take, which is a good problem to have, obviously, sometimes. Uh, but check back off to that. That varies, right? But sometimes I might not do a full loaf, the full 2%. Usually I try to, but I find that it, it starts getting a little bit more tougher for me to see those bigger equity swings and by the way psychologically you know people say why do you have multiple accounts well you've got like iras you've got qualified non-qualified money and just the way that all kind of shook out over the years i did end up with multiple accounts it wasn't like i set out to start with all these multiple accounts it just kind of ended up that way anyway so one thing i find does help me i'm able to deal a lot easier with smaller numbers as opposed to like if i could see two thousand three thousand dollars or whatever two three thousand dollars in profits and deal with that i can handle that really easily and i can handle that across multiple accounts over and over and over but if i have something that's like four thousand or eight thousand dollars and it starts to evaporate quickly and all things change a little bit even though it's it's no different than just a decimal moving one point with a smaller account. So hopefully that'll make sense. So sometimes if I have a little bit larger accounts, larger than say the hypothetical portfolio, I might take a few, a few a fewer or less shares, a little bit less than 2% risk. Now, if everything's blowing and going, I'm doing fantastic, then I'll, I'll step on the gas a little bit and go at least to the 2% number. By the way, trying to get a sponsor. So Liquid Death, if you're watching, love your product. <laughs> all right let's take a look at res res energy company obviously nice little love trend notice it did begin to accelerate higher which is one of my favorite things also notice for an energy company this is hard to find but notice that it tended to go up day after day after day in other words it was very persistent and then it began to accelerate so it's kind of a kind of a mis mishmash uh conglomerate of several of my 
my patterns. It's um, persistent pullback. It's also a little bit of accelerating momentum strategy, a generic pullback. And you can see, so it was a really nice uptrend, accelerated higher, began to pull back, and I liked it, especially because it's an energy, and energies have been trading opposite, not opposite, but have been trading higher in a lot of cases in lieu of the overall market. They've been sort of negatively correlated in some cases to the market. We'll take a look at the energy stocks in just one second. Anyway, entry was here, stop was down here, initial profit target up here, and you can see it triggers and meanders around quite a bit. And believe me, it's hard to hang on to a position. And as I've said before, through doing the service, I have an unfair advantage. Number one, I see a lot of mistakes that, that are being made, and it reminds me not to make them. And number two, if I'm going to throw something out there for you, if I think it's good enough for you, then it's got to be good enough for me. And actually, I do just the opposite. I find something that's good enough for me, something I just can't stand not taking, double negative there, but something that I feel like I have to take. And then those are the trades that I show you. Now, if there's something, as I said, in the frequently asked questions for the service, there's something that's super duper volatile or low price, or it might be considered super duper speculative or an s g type trade that obviously i won't show that as an official setup so sometimes i will go on the fringe a little bit with some of these things but anyway this would was going to be my near miss example because i did take profits a little bit early on this one i took profits yesterday on this one and then today it officially hit that initial profit target so half of the shares come off when that happens and your stop goes to break even the same as your entry as i preach day in and day out so now with this position you are free rolling so to speak kind of hate to use the word playing with the market's money but you now have a free position if you can establish enough free positions you will become very successful over time not overnight okay <laughs> if that were the case you wouldn't be seeing you'd never see my fat ass again right but it, it does take a little while and you really have to chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it and be really, really, really patient. And then eventually these great trends do come along, even in a crappy market sometimes like now. Now there's been crappy markets where I can't hit the side of, of the mark outside of the barn. So I don't wanna imply that it always works as well, but if you work hard and you're looking at sectors and looking at a couple thousand stocks every night, and learning how to pick the best and leave the rest and looking for persistency and acceleration and a nice little pullback and all these other good things with a heavy dose of money management then it can over time work out very nicely not every time but over time so here is which one are we looking at here i've already forgotten okay yeah this is sghc there's the entry, there's a protective stop, the initial profit target, 1.25 is the risk. If you're new to the methodology, we do not use fi fixed risk, okay? It might be, in some cases, it might be five or six points like this Dell trade up here and the CENX trade. In other cases, it might be one point like this ARLP. It depends on the price of stock, the volatility of stock, and where a stop would be placed and that stop is placed at a level where you're you would be obviously wrong but outside of the normal noise of the market i have a whole module just on money management behind the firewall in the members area little shameless plug there but it's all out there and that's why i created that learning management system is so if it, i'm sitting here you, i don't know if you noticed but i'm sitting there doing this cracking my wrist <laughs> One thing I've been doing lately, like I find if I put it against my forehead, I can crack it. And my wife's like, you can't run around doing this all day. So she's been really on me <laughs> for that. But uh, through answering all the emails over the years, I've kind of ruined my uh, my wrist and elbow. I've already had one surgery on the elbow. But anyway, I wanted to put something out there. So if I get, God forbid, hit by a beer truck, then it's there, okay? And you know one of one of the nice things that someone said it was Mike P from our group, 
and he he didn't know who I was. He didn't know from me from Adam when I was guest of honor a few years back at Charlie Kirk's retreat down in St. Lucia. And he goes, well, let me just Google this Dave guy. And he found a forum, and I guess it'd be like 24 years now. This was a few years back. But he found a forum that was 20 years prior where I was saying the same exact thing that I'm saying now. And it was really a compliment. And he was very impressed that I'm still doing the same stuff. Bow ties, pullbacks, the same money management, the same position management, et cetera. And he contrasts that to someone and I would never throw anyone under the bus, but if I said the name, you would know who it is, who has a system du jour. And every month he comes out and tells you about this fantastic system. And if you just give him $3,000 or $300, maybe $3,000, he'll give you this fantastic system. But last month he had a fantastic system. So it's like, well, wait a minute. What happened to the thing you sold me last month for $3,000? Well, I'm not selling you a system for $3,000. In fact, I'll give you my books for free. I think if you go to DaveLeonard.com slash free dash book, you'll get all three of my books for free. Or if you just become a uh, a member of DaveLeonard.com and not a, you don't have to be even a paid member, just a free member on the newsletter, you'll get the books for free. But anyway, so this is what I actually do. It, it's It's not that complex. That's why I trademarked the phrase trading simplified. And as one of you pointed out, somebody else took that and <laughs> trademarked something very similar. But hey, imitation is a sincerest form of flattery. So here we have another pullback. Surprise, surprise. Nice uptrend. Also notice it accelerated higher. And I think this is one of these DSPAC things. And, and I think one of you guys was saying you weren't going to take it because it had some older trader trading back in time. And it does. But as I said before, I'm not exactly sure. I don't have an exact policy for these DSPOC stocks. SPOC is what? Special Purpose Acquisition Company or SPACs, as some people call them. I like to call them SPACs. I think, I think it sounds a little cooler. And they go DSPOC is when they when they end up acquiring the, the company they intend to acquire. So from what I see, and don't quote me on this, do your own due diligence, but from what I see, especially if it's set up with all these other wonderful things I like, these DSPAC companies can do really well and they behave a lot like a hot IPO. So anyway, you can see nice uptrend in, in here and then it accelerated higher. That's another one of my favorite patterns. So this is accelerating momentum strategy. It also has some persistency. You can draw a line through most of the bars, as you can see. And we've got a nice little deep pullback. People always say, well, Dave, exactly how deep should a pullback be? It's like, well, it depends. But in a case like this, you had a pretty decent run in the stock, 50% or more. You want to see a fairly deep pullback to make sure some people were knocked out of the market. Go in and watch presentations I've done on trend knockouts. You can go to my YouTube channel, Dave, oh, always get it mixed up, YouTube slash C slash Dave Landry. It searched for TKO or trend knockout and learn a little bit about that pattern. But along the lines of the psychology of the trend knockout, you want to make sure the pullback is deep enough to have knocked out some players and possibly even attracted in some potential shorts. And if the market begins to rally, you sort of take advantage of the predicament of those traders. The shorts might be squeezed out and those people who bailed out because they got shaken out or knocked out, however you want to look at it, they might be encouraged to get back in out of FOMO, fear of being left behind. So anyway, nice little deep pullback, as I've been saying. Entry was here, stop was down there. And by the way, if you want to see all of these trades, okay, without the benefit of hindsight, you can go to DaveLander.com slash archives, and you can look at all these trades. And what I'll do as soon as possible, maybe as early as tomorrow, April 15th, I'll get the current archives on the back end. So any of these trades I'm showing now that were fairly recent will be in there too. Anyway, IPT was up here and it took a few days to trigger, but it finally triggered. But within one day it shot up and it came pretty close to the IPT. Now, so you're in a trade, you're the second day in the trade, maybe not even 24 hours into the trade, right? I'd like to, I need to look at the times when some of these things triggered. I think it becomes a bit of a gift horse when that occurs. And in this case, how many shares I put on? Okay, I put on 2,000 shares. 
and it was fairly close at an IPG. It wasn't quite there. I realized that it wasn't like a near, very close within a hair of the IPG. But hey, that's within, like I just said, 24 hours of putting on a trade. You got a pretty good move. And the problem is, a lot of times, as we saw at least earlier today, now it did recoup all of those gains and then some, all those losses and then some. But a lot of times, the market will get ahead of itself when it moves that fast. Okay. And again, it's much more exciting when, when they overnight, bam, you got a huge winner on your hands and boy, it's exciting. But it's a lot harder for the market to sustain that longer term. So I would much rather make twice as much as I made in something like an SST over six months or even a year as opposed to that one and done type of pop. I like to be in a trade a lot, lot longer and hold on and then it becomes more sustainable and more of a gradual type of trend. But hey, I'm not going to complain about an overnight pop. But anyway, as you can see down here in the trades, it was like one buck and it was a gift horse by the time I got out. It was a little bit higher than at 1101 but by the time i said you know i'm looking at this as a gift horse i better take some profits and usually what i will do because discretion is something that you have to kind of think about right i'll have the the trade the setup the ipt the entry the stop the initial stop at least all that is laid out and then the trailing stop is laid out as we go through the trade hopefully as it moves in our favor i know you said hope but just to show you that, you can say, well, Dave, that's all in hindsight, this discretion. Well, I will, if I'm thinking about doing something on a discretionary basis, I will put out Smoke and Watch on SGHC. Two, two reasons. One, because I'm thinking about doing it myself. And then two, to let everybody know that, hey, this thing might be getting close. Go ahead and think about it. And if you take a look at some of the posts here, you can see that, or maybe some buried further down, and on other ones that I've showed recently, or just tonight, I should say, a lot of people have used a little bit of discretion. So I'll I want to make it so you can see that it is repeatable. And by the way, that's the very important thing to do when it comes to trading is repeatability. And years ago, I was involved with a website and they had a gentleman and evidently he was successful, but he was he was trading e minis like the rat hitting the button for the cocaine, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. In and out. And it drove the clients absolutely nuts. So he he allegedly, or I guess I'm guessing, you know, he was successful. But could you be successful too? And I saw someone else, and, and again, I never throw anybody under the bus. And if you looked at all of their trades, and they were trading through this certain platform with certain kind of direct access or something or whatever. But I looked at all of their trades once, and their edge was a nickel on every trade. And that's a very, 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 very tiny, 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 tiny edge. And he was trading fairly big size. I guess it's kind of a more of a scalping type of methodology. But that's not a good edge. And if you try to repeat that without this special access or however he did it to, to, to make sure he's getting you know, perfect, absolutely perfect execution. And by the way, you won't get perfect execution. You'll see some of the trades in here. Uh, they might look a little sloppy. The entry might be a little late or maybe I got some skittage or slippage or whatever. So it's going to happen. And that's another thing that the longer term home run is going to help quite a bit. And also the taking partial profits. Okay. Let's say we're looking for a thousand dollars for that 1% move on a hundred thousand dollar account. Okay. So we're looking for a 1% move overall, okay, not in the stock. That might be 20% or 30% depending on the, the volatility of the stock. But if we're looking for that, and let's say we get 800 bucks or 900 bucks, we get fairly close at $1,000. That's okay because the real money is in the longer term trend and hanging on to these things for hopefully, and I know you said hope, but hopefully a long, long, long time. You can see where the discussion went about people say, well, what if you don't take the IPT, and just hang on? And I chipped in to the conversation and said, or my two cents was that you're gonna start looking a lot more like a longer term trend follower. And longer term trend following is great, don't get me wrong, but if you're a pure longer term trend follower and you're not getting into it through the free rolling, 
through the swing trade going to the intermediate term trade and hopefully longer then you you're gonna your accuracy is gonna be abysmal okay and your drawdowns are also going to be abysmal like the turtles and and again, I would never throw anybody under the bus, but I don't think there's many turtles that are still successful traders. They were in the right place at the right time, and they caught a really good trend, and God bless them for doing it, and it's, it's, it was a very amazing thing that they did, but I think those days are, are gone. So I think the way I solved, so to speak, for the dilemma of the longer-term trading having such low such a low hit rate and such abysmal drawdowns is to take the short term trade and then work toward turning that into a longer term trade just like I'm showing you with all the ones in here and then maybe next week we'll go in and pick up some of the ones like ARLP we've been in that for like a year and a half I think I think that triggered in January of 2021 if memory serves. So it's been over a year, almost a year and a half, we've been in that stock, maybe not quite, but you get the drift. Anyway, so that's the secret, so to speak, is establishing these free positions and having a few of them turn into longer term trends. And believe me, the, the, the real money is in the longer term trend trading, but that's also where the risk and the drawdowns are, okay? So that creates a dilemma, as I said before. The short-term trading, you're going to be a little bit more accurate, okay? Uh, my voice just cracked. You're going to be a little bit more accurate because maybe you'll get that reversion to the mean move in the direction of trend. Okay, let's use this stock as an example. So it pops higher, and you get that swing trade out, and then it comes right back in. That happens fairly often. And by the way, this same conversation comes up over and over and over when we are hitting IPTs and then the stock takes off after, we do that again, again, and again. Everyone says, Dave, why are we taking IPTs? Why don't we just hang on? When, as I've said a thousand times before, when these stocks pop up, hit the IPT, drop out. Pop up, hit the IPT, drop out. That happens a dozen times in a row. I mean, it can happen. People are like, well, Dave, why don't we just take 100%? Well, the reason is we don't know what's going to happen. We take sort of a dumb approach is the way I kind of look at it, a trend following moron approach, and we let the market tell us what to do. We let the market decide whether or not the position is worth keeping. And one thing I've been writing a little bit about lately, and I've talked about this before too, and I try to explain it to a lot of people. It's like uh, on a personal level, people that I know, when they ask me about markets, it's like, okay, you know, they'll come up with some kind of idea. And it's like, well, that might work and that might be viable, but their theme, so to speak, is only going to work if the market dovetails in with their theme, okay? And I let themes find me. I bought a coal stock, what is it, a year and a half ago, the ARLP is coal stock, and people might have thought back then, why in the hell would you buy a coal stock, especially with an administration coming in or might have already been in that's going to be anti-coal and and all these other things it's like well it, it's going up and it looks good to me and then i didn't know that down the road we would end up with this energy crisis to where coal would still be important okay all right so george says so try to get ipt before it clears the pb well not necessarily okay so what george is saying is okay the ipt in this particular case, in a lot of cases, it will be, okay? So you have the you have the pullback. I don't know how I can do this, but so you have the pullback is this, and then the IPT is like right here. A lot of cases that works out. And a lot of cases it's pretty cool when it does. You get to pop right back to the old highs, and it might encounter some resistance. And and you go back and look at the rewind this if you can stand it. If you watch the recording, and see how the other ones were. But if memory serves, I think they all were. You are correct, close to the prior high. So, yes, that would be great if you could take your initial profit targets there. But sometimes the volatility of the market, the depth of the pullback, et cetera, doesn't allow it. And your your IPT is above that old high. But if that's something you want to explore, George, that, that might be something to look into. But I'm going to caution you not to because I think you're exploring enough stuff as, an, as a somewhat newer trader 
George has been with us, I think, uh, about a year or so, maybe a year and a half now. So I kind of tapped the brakes a little bit on trying to do too much research. And, and I dig that you're, you're trying to absorb it all. But yeah, you might be on to something there. So maybe put that in your notes to something that you might want to take a look at down the road. And, and maybe there is something there. And I always feel like when I'm looking at a position, and it's it's sort of like I said, I think it might have worked out just like like you said, some of these other ones. But especially in these deep pullbacks, usually on these deep pullbacks, okay, it's enough. Because so this is like let's say a 20, 25 percent pullback. Well, then obviously a pop higher would be, it I guess it'd be thirty percent or so. I can't do the math in my head that quickly. The 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 pop higher would be a bigger percentage gain because you're starting at a lower level. But if you think in terms of like a rubber band, the rubber band gets stretched and then it goes back to where it was. And then we're, what we're hoping is, one, we can take profits once it pops back, is what you're saying. And, and a lot of times that does work out with the money management, but then hold on for that longer term gain and free roll, so to speak. Here's CEN Access is another one. This was not a perfect example. And I almost tossed it out the last minute, but it does show you another case of possible discretion. So nice uptrend here, pullback. This is a metals and mining stock. I think it's aluminium. Entry was here, and the entry was not this close initially. This entry was here when the stock was probably down here. Again, you can go and look at the archives. IPT was up here. So it gets higher, so you didn't get that you didn't get that perfect entry that we were looking for down here at 25. It, you did get in a little bit higher. This was the gap and go situation, which makes it a little tougher. Let's say a gap's higher like this and it comes right back in. Then you would avoid the trade and maybe look to get in intraday if it takes out the intraday high, as I've said before. But it did come fairly close to the IPT and it did it over a couple of days. And again, if it gets there quickly, the velocity of how fast it gets there, makes a big move over a day or two, then don't split hairs. Be willing to take those partial profits a little early. And again, that's not where the real money is in those partial profits, but it does keep you in the game. And the secret to this game, like Mr. Druckenmiller said, is preservation of capital and home runs. And that's where we're setting ourselves up for hopefully, and you should never say that, but set yourself up to where it possibly might work, that occasional home run. Okay, that's all I really wanted to cover tonight. Any questions on the money management, any questions on those setups or anything we talked about, or any other questions, of course. And if there's no questions, I'll go ahead and shift gears and I'll pop into crypto real quick and we'll take a look at that. And if you have any crypto pairs you want to look at, I'll tell you right now, a little spoiler alert, crypto's back to looking crappy again. The shit coins are looking shitty. <laughs> I think I just demonetized my video. All right, let's take a look at that real quick. And if you guys want to talk about, start talking about individual stocks, uh, you could ask about those too. Just put a dollar sign in front of any of the crypto pairs so I don't get them mixed up with the stocks. So the ones in blue are the ones that I had been looking at, and I probably need to clean up this list. I, I, I was busy this week with stocks quite a bit. I got excited about crypto over the last week or so, and then crypto just kind of fell out of bed once again. It's kind of interesting. Crypto gets hot, and then it falls out of bed. So I'll probably need to go through this blue list and clean it up quite a bit. I do like to keep Ethereum and Bitcoin in the list. I, they uh, delayed once again, Ethereum going to proof of stake. And I'm not a fan of them going to proof of stake. I noticed some environmental concerns, which some other people have said, well, Bitcoin is not as horrible as it sounds and there's all kind of arguments there that i want to stay completely out of but as far as the operational standpoint and me wrapping my head around it this crypto thing that is proof of work is a better model than proof of stake now i know you could argue for the environment and all those other things but that's 
I'm just looking at it from a operational standpoint. And the thing to think about is, and I watched the documentary, it wasn't that good. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of a sucker for these documentaries where people go missing and so does a couple hundred million dollars or whatever. I find that kind of interesting. But it's a documentary, I think it's on Netflix. And it's, uh, I think it's called Trust No One. It's where some kid had an exchange and allegedly he took $300 million and ran a Ponzi scheme or whatever off of that money. So if there's a chance for human nature, the ugly side of human nature to rear its ugly head, it's going to happen. And I think that the, the, the proof of work where you've got thousands of people all around the world competing to prove the transactions that are happening with the Bitcoin to generate or mine, so to speak, the Bitcoin, I think that's a that's a better model than proof of stake because proof of stake is whoever owns the most controls it, and then it could get really ugly if too many too if too few of people are controlling it. Whereas if it's decentralized as it should be for a cryptocurrency, that's kind of the whole idea that it's better off. So I'm gonna just get off my soapbox there, and I know there's environmental concerns, so don't beat me up on that. But anyway, here's some that's. I have been long or recently long, but you can see that a few of these aren't doing so hot. Take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is now, well, first of all, it's all over the place, okay? It's a Jackie Mason market. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. But now it's kind of in a down phase, obviously, okay? I wouldn't I wouldn't go long or short Bitcoin if I had to I put a gun to my head, which my wife hates when I say that, <laughs> being a trader with all my ups and downs, but for lack of a better term, I would say that uh, Bitcoin would actually almost be a short at this point. I do have a little bit hodled. I don't believe in, in hodling, but I think a tiny bit ain't going to kill you in this particular case. And let's see, the trader in me, it's going to be hard for me to hang on. So we'll see how long I can hold on to it. <laughs> but anyway, the cryptocurrencies aren't looking so hot in here. But check back often and just sorting by the, the, the strongest ones. I'm not too excited, by the way, of buying these things as they bounce off lows. But if they're breaking out to new highs with a little bit of vigor and they're thick enough, then I'm willing to go after them. I do have a position here, full disclosure. If it's pink, I have a position or recently had a position. I do think I still have some of that. At least based on tonight's action, I hope I have some. I think it's a very tiny position, though. But anyway, it's not a whole lot of excitement. So anybody want to take a look at any of these pairs? I know I've been talking via PM with some of you guys on some of these. So, But anyway, you can see that even by sorting them by strength, they really don't look that fantastic now. But the thing about crypto is it moves really fast. It trades 24 hours a day. And I did the math on that a while back, and I forget how it turns out. Let's see, 24, divided by 6. Yeah, so round numbers, crypto is open four times more than stocks. And then if you add in weekends and holidays, it's open five times more than stocks. And it was kind of sad. I was going in and looking at my trades from last year, trying to figure out taxes, which is a nightmare with crypto or candy, um, I was kind of bummed out looking like on Thanksgiving day, I was out frying turkeys and in between frying turkeys, that was one of my biggest days I've ever had in crypto as far as, especially as far as hitting initial profit targets. I think it hit six or seven on that day. And it was uh, really, really, really cool. So anyway, when they go, they go right now, they're not going, you know, my problem, I, I woke up thinking about this this morning and put it in my notes. The problem is, when crypto's hot, I'm all over it. And then when it cools off, sometimes I forget to stay on top of it. So one thing you might want to do, and one of you guys showed me this, is if you go to crypto.com, there's a way to get the tickers to the hot tickers to show up. So you might wanna, you might want to at the least pull that up and then make sure you take a look at those pairs just in case something's taken off without you. But right now, not too excited about crypto, okay? You know, this was the crypto bull last year, and I was kind of bullish a few weeks back, but since it's gone down, 
I am not that excited. And I just did a presentation for some people in Italy, and I was excited to show them my favorite moving average. I know you're a party with me for crypto, and that is a 30 EMA. And if all you did was not buy any pairs as long as they were or below the 30 EMA, you would do pretty good. Okay. You would certainly do a lot better than buying them below the 30. So take a look at this chick coin. Okay. 85 cents up here. And now we're down to what? Three cents, two cents. Okay. So just keep an eye on that 30 EMA. And that's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble. As we go through these, you can see pair after pair after pair. Don't buy them unless they're back above their 30 EMA. If you don't know anything about trading, that's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble. The other thing, and thank you, George, for reminding me of that. I was getting ready, I was actually getting ready to say that. Uh, George said he's had some success with the 230 EMA. And all we're doing there is we look at we're looking for two bars above, two lows above, two days of Landry light above the 30 EMA, and then go long above those highs. So go back to my YouTube channel. And I think in the quick clips, I've got a few clips where I show that particular system in crypto. Damn it, I just deleted one. I hate that. <laughs> so now I don't know which one I deleted. With um telechart, spacebar brings you forward and, and backspace brings you back. So I just went to do a backspace to show you a setup and I knocked out one. But anyway, I was just gonna try to find a, a 230 EMA. So I wouldn't rush out and buy this one, but it is one of the stronger ones, okay? So this would be bar one, this would be bar two, okay? Your entry would be above that high, so the entry would have been here at 23, and so forth, so good. That's one of the better looking ones. I, I'm not long, but I think that if I had to buy one tonight, this would be the one that I would buy, hot cross, okay? All right, let's hop into the market real quick, and then uh, if you have any individual stocks you guys want me to look at, Probably no shocker that there's no crypto you want to look at because there's no crypto I think that needs to be looked at. Okay, let's take a look at the P's. My big concern, as I've said ad nauseum, is that first of all, the market sells off hard, right? And then it has a mother of all retraces. And as I've said, one of my buddies, I asked, I, I told him when we got the TFM 10% sell system, it's like, hey, look. We have the sell system. I'm uh, I'm out. Okay, as far as anything with the overall market, doesn't mean I'm not still in individual stocks and not still buying individual stocks. If it's an energy or an IPO or what's that SG, whatever that SST does, <laughs> gambling or SGHC, I think it's gambling. If it's going up, I'm in. Right, as a trend following moron. But anyway, I said you might want to talk to your guys. Like, well, my guys. Said he's getting more aggressive, and I must have rolled my eyes. He's like, "Well, my guys made me a lot of money." I'm thinking, "Yeah, I think the markets back this chart out have made you a lot of money." Well, just a few days ago, when markets getting iffy again, now he is actually starting to get concerned. So, long story endless. Where I'm going with that, I know I repeated this a couple of times over the last couple of weeks, but where I'm going with that is, I think the man on the street, when you roll over after a retrace like this. It's it's kind of like it's, they then began to take things more seriously. Psychologically, if you think about it, as long as the market's coming right back, you know, whew, I dodged a bullet. And, and one of my other friends that I work out with is like, good Lord, I looked at my portfolio yesterday and I'm down this tremendous amount. And I'm like, eh, it looks like we're rolling back over. But again, check back often. But with today's action down, what, percent and change? Usually, and I was buying inverse shares today. Uh, flipped them out by the close and, and options on inverse shares. And a little birdie in the back of my head the whole time kept saying, Dave, why are you getting so bearish the day before a holiday? Usually the day before a holiday is a good time to be long. And I'll have to ask Rob Hanna, a buddy of mine does a lot of uh, mechanical type testing, and he's tested things like that before. And he could tell you what the edge is. So there is an edge usually the day before holiday. What's that? 18% alcohol, good Lord. 
<laughs> I'm kidding. Take a look at Barnes. Okay, Barnes are in the toilet, obviously. Lowest level in a long, 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 long time. Bonds go down. What's that mean with rates? Rates are going up. Okay, no big shocker there. I, uh, my wife used to always send me to the store, still does, because she can't look at prices. And they never really bothered me. But now I'm starting to look at it. And uh, I used to be able to get three pounds of ground meat for $9.99. And now, grabbed a pack last night, two and a half pounds, $18 or something like that. It's like, good Lord. You used to buy, you used to be able to, you used to be able to buy, steaks for that you know <laughs> whipped cream that i like for my coffee is uh ten dollars now it's like good lord it's ridiculous even ludicrous would say it's ludicrous nasdaq composites we did a 180 from yesterday down two percent a little bit more indicative of what i've been worried about it's not the end of the world just yet i'm a trend follower right let's just see what happens okay we are a little wide and loose in here and yeah you could argue well we're at the same level we were months ago so the trend is sideways and maybe it is but again my big concern is we have a big retrace and then roll right back over keep an eye on this low in here we take that out it could get ugly yes this has a bit of a head and shoulders bottom but i'm not a big fan of bottoms at tops okay so this looks like more of a bigger picture top to me than it does an intermediate term or shorter term bottom and on a weekly basis, it's a little easier to see, right? Thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, and then sliding again. Okay. Kind of, kind of, you can kind of see the forest for the trees. And by the way, the TFM system was actually a buy. I did not take the buy signal because we were just barely above the 50 simple moving average on a weekly basis. And also the, bar was actually like a down bar okay and that's that's not part of the system the system says mechanically you get in if you have a buy signal well i ignored this buy signal because of what the way it played out and so far it looks like that's the thing to do but we'll see check back off it i'm okay let me go back to the piece and let me just show you what i'm talking about there in fact, what I could do is let me just shift gears and show you real quick in ACP. And let me just get this ACP up and running. So if we go to ACP and let's put in the, let's do the two years weekly with the TFM 10% system, okay? And then let's do cash, because that's what all my testing was with, or on, I should say. You really have to squint your eyes to see the daylight that's right there, okay? I'm sure if I zoom in on that, you can see it maybe. In fact, we could do that. And to those who aren't familiar, just a crash course in the system. Okay, so you could see, really really squint your, squint, your, squint your eyes and the designer's intent was here's one bar landry light okay lows well above the 50 week moving average and that's what the designer's intent so to speak okay what i had in mind was show me some strength well in this bar here it's a lot of weakness and it closed fairly poorly down toward the bottom of the range and you really really have to squint your eyes so i would not take that as a buy signal and here's the thing okay so what if what if next week it went straight up that's fine with me then i would take it as a buy signal maybe use this high as an entry or maybe even think okay you know what dave maybe we'll use the two bar high as a possible entry before going long okay and in general i don't have longer term holdings i do have a little cash uh for my daughters left over from college and i've resisted the temptation of trading it although i like to just in case they ever wanted or whatever and i'd go through a drawdown they'd kill me uh maybe longer term i will but what i people always say you have long-term holdings and i'm like well not really but i do have a little bit of their money and i do have some money that's long story endless is tied up that I, that i'm limited with 
and I'll actually put it in stuff like energy funds and things like that, and I'll show you that real quick. And something like the TFM 10% system could work really well there. Let's see if this is, this is it. No. So I'm long a couple of these markets. And the reason is because, of course, they're going up, okay? So you could see bought in somewhere in here or whatever. And so far, knock on wood, it's doing okay. Shifted out of maybe stocks in general, like S&P 500, and then into these metal and mining stocks and hard asset type of stocks such as this one here so you can do so tech i do have a few tiny tiny bit of longer term holdings but in general i am a trader and i do trade but something like this where you're limited to how much in and out you can do then i will do some longer term holdings in that so anyway that was the that was a tfm 10 percent system so we're no longer in a buy Okay, if the last buy would have been like a really solid buy, I would have gone long and I'd be in a holding pattern right now. Okay, so that's where we are with that. Let me just pop right back. I'm going to show you a couple of sectors. And then if there's any, again, if there's any stocks, I'm not going to ask six times like I normally do. So if we don't get any stocks come up, by the time we get the stocks, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll shut things down. And the reason I'm saying it like that is we, we talk about stocks during the day in the Facebook group. So I, I realize that everybody's questions have probably already been answered. Okay, Russell 2000. Still looks like a big fat top to me. Shorter term, it's kind of bottoming out here by chopping sideways. But even if it does take out this recent high in here, it has a mound of overhead supply to get through. So not too excited about the rusty. Energy is looking pretty good longer term in here. They close at all time highs today. They have lost a little bit of steam as of late. I like to see I like to see them accelerate higher, but in general they're looking pretty good. Ditto for metals and mining, kind of bumping up against their old highs in here. I like to see them bust through, not look back for a while, and then make some orderly pullbacks along the way. Drugs, another one of those areas that has defied gravity straight up for the most part. A little bit of a correction in here. Not seeing a whole lot of setups here just yet, but I possibly will. What's interesting is I'm seeing super speculative stocks setting up. Stocks that have bottomed out from a long time ago are now beginning to kind of rise from the ash. It's kind of like the Phoenix strategy we talk about sometimes where you look for bow ties and, and, and things of that nature, these patterns that are coming off of these low levels. Biotechnology doesn't look as good as drugs. You back bio way out. It still looks kind of iffy longer term, and it's been pretty choppy as of late. The other one was retrace, possible rollback over situations, but not very clean at all, of course. Take a look at the semiconductors. This is what's really concerning me here. I always like the semiconductors to match what's going on in the overall market. There's some old school people who like to look at the transports, and I can't ignore that completely. But the semiconductors are sort of like your information superhighway, the highway, uh, the newer highway, so to speak, for a lot of this stuff. And I think it's important to pay attention to the semis. And today we closed at a new multi-month low. And we closed at new lows for the year. Now, closing highs and closing lows, correction, we might be off. Okay, this is a closing low right there. We're getting close, okay? I didn't see this close, so correction on that. But we're close to closing at a new closing low. Closing lows and closing highs have a psychological impact on the market. So what I'm saying is, let's say a market shoots up to all-time highs and then, or let's say you've got all-time highs here, okay? And let's say it closed like right here. And then over here, it closes at a new closing high, not an all-time high, but a new closing high. Sometimes those signals can be pretty good to watch. And on the downside, a new closing low. If we make a new closing low in here, it could get kind of ugly. And if you think about it, if it's going to close down here somewhere, drop half of the value, it's going to have to close at a new low before it does that. Okay. Telecom's doing pretty good in here. I'm not seeing anything that I'm excited about, but it has been going up. So I'll have to start paying attention to see if we could find something here. But the database usually speaks and speaks loudly and will tell us where the setups are. Take a look at these transports. 
we made all time high, rolled over, went up to make all time highs, and then nope, died out. And then now we got a little bit of retrace rally. I would never buy a market like this or 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 anything for that matter. But if I had to guess a direction, it sure looks like we've rolled over and pulled back, and looks like we could head could head lower here. All right, I think that's pretty much it. Let's take a look at the dollar, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. The dollar probed all-time highs today, or is it all-time highs? I think so. Well, multi-year highs came off its best level, but it did close at multi-year highs. See, there's your closing high right there. So that's a good thing. I'm glad to see the dollar hanging in there. As one of you pointed out last week, one of the Johns, I think, just because the dollar's strong with the UUP doesn't mean that inflation is not here, and it doesn't reflect the actual purchasing power of the dollar. All right, George, let's take a look at P-Lab. Okay. Is it, okay, here's the thing. Shorting is, shorting is kind of tough, and I'm not really seeing a lot of clean shorts setting up right now. So his question is, is the pullback deep enough? Well, sometimes with a short, you don't get the nice deep pullback that you want. But this chart is kind of funky. And, you know, look over here. You've got so much trading over here, so much support below. So what are you going to get? Um, let's say you probably get in around 15 and a quarter. And then as soon as it gets to 14, maybe, if that ha if that much, it's going to hit a lot of support down here. And this thing's kind of all over the place. So I would try to find something cleaner. Remember when we shorted, uh, you're on the trading service. So remember we shorted Dell a while back. And it's not an absolute perfect example, but back here when it first broke down from highs, you've got a major, major top. It first broke down from highs and then had a little bit of a, of a short bounce back. And we looked at short it, of course. That's what happens when you short. They tend to go against you, right? So I'm not really seeing anything worthwhile on the short side. There's one in the Landry list tonight, starts with a G, so check that one out. But other than that, I'm not really seeing a whole lot to get excited about on the short side. The short side, again, it's hard to make money on the short side. Not that I won't short. I, I love shorting sometimes, okay? But in general, I'd rather go long a market because usually, usually what happens is you get short, it goes straight up, it knocks you out, and then it implodes. In this particular case, it came dangerously close to the stop, which I think was at 55 and change, right? And then it rolled over, okay? We're still not the IPT yet on this one. All right, any more? Going once, going twice. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight, especially with it being right in front of a holiday weekend. And and looks like we set an attendance number, so I'm, I'm very humbled and very thankful for that. To those who celebrate, happy Easter. And to everybody else, enjoy your break from the markets and hopefully it's a long holiday for you where you are in your part of the world. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much.